Um, I am Stefan Karpinski. I'm one of the co-creators of Julia, which is a, a fast dynamic language for technical computing, which is the title of my talk in the program. But what I'm specifically going to talk about today is this question of whether numerical computing is the killer app, or a killer app at least, for staged programming. And if you don't know what staged programming is, that's OK. Hang in. You're going to find out. Um, I'm also one of the co-founders of Julia Computing, which is a company that the creators of the language and some other people we started to do support and training and consulting. So if anybody gets into doing Julia and finds that they need help, you can talk to us. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a context for the programming language at this polyglot conference, um, this is a, a, a square which sort of diagrams where different languages are. Um, along two axes, which are pure versus impure. So do your functions have side effects um, or not? Uh, and also t whether they talk about types or whether they don't talk about types. Um, and so a classic language that is pure and talks about types is Haskell. Um, a classic language, language that is impure and talks about types is C. Um, you know, the Ur language for being impure and you know, not and not talking about types is Lisp, um, and I couldn't think of any real used programming language that fits in the other corner. So the only thing I could think to put in here was the Lambda calculus, pure and doesn't talk about types. Um, can we think of something that goes in there, like a programming language that is pure and doesn't talk about types? Is that true? Okay, yeah. So there you go, Mini Cameron. I'll add that the next time I'm doing this. Um, so other you know, popular languages that are in the uh, Lisp, Lisp corner are Python and R. Um, they're totally happy with having side effects. They t they don't, you don't really talk about types. You don't have a type system. Um, Julia is in this unusual corner with C. It's not that unusual to being there with C. What is unusual is that there's a third dimension to this, which I couldn't do in three dimensions because I just it would get crazy, um, is whether they're static or dynamic. So usually, if you're in the top half of this diagram, you are static. And if you're in the bottom half of this diagram, you are dynamic. Julia is odd that it is a dynamic language that is in the top half of this diagram. Um, so we're sort of exploring the, the design space of languages in this, in this particular respect. Is like, what happens if you try to do something up in this corner that you know, hasn't, hasn't really been done before? Um, there, have, there have been things that do this, but you know, we're giving it a shot. Um, so here's some some interesting features about Julia. Um, it is specific, so it's specifically designed for just-in-time compilation. So just-in-time compilation is a well-known, like widely used technique for uh, you know making dynamic languages go fast. Uh, since you can't do ahead-of-time compilation for a dynamic language, um, but usually it's bolted on after the fact. It's a thing that you sort of you take this existing dynamic language and you're like, okay, we can JIT co machine code. Uh, just when we need it, and then we can we we can get the thing, the program to run faster. So we designed the language from the ground up to make it really good for just-in-time compilation, to make it actually way easier to do these things. And in fact, as a result, we need to do way less shenanigans. Usually, like you know, your your V8 engine or whatever your your fast uh, JavaScript engines do some very they you know they they speculatively decide that I think this thing is always going to be an int. So I'm going to generate some code that checks if it's an int and then does a really efficient thing. And then if they discover that the thing is not actually an int when the code is running, they bail out and do something slow. And sometimes they do crazy stuff like uh, de-optimize your stack and run some other code with like you know continuing exactly where you left off. Um, that we don't actually do any of that fancy stuff. Uh, Carl Carl Boltz, who's one of the PyPy guys, told me one time he said that uh, Julia is actually ahead of time compilation at runtime. And I was like. What is it? Isn't that what JIT is? And then I, I realized that what he meant is that JIT is actually often meant means this whole like bag of other tricks that people do that we don't actually do. So we are just ahead of time compilation at runtime. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that when we when we get into the REPL part of the talk. Um, so we have this expressive language of types, so we can actually talk about types. Um, and I'll talk about why that's necessary for numerical computing. Um, that allows us to have a powerful multiple dispatch system. So multiple multiple dispatch is a generalization of single dispatch, where you, you know, you have this object that you call a method on, and the type of the object, the di the runtime type of the object determines exactly what code gets executed. So a function can have different methods for different types. 
Um, multiple dispatch lets you do that, but it actually does dispatch dynamically on all the types of all of your arguments. Uh, that's particularly handy for numerical stuff because it's pretty frequently like if you if you're adding two things, what you do depends on the types of both of the things, not just the type of one of the things. So that's just one classic example. Um, there's actually many other things that it's really useful for. Um, we have Lisp style metaprogramming and macros. Um, and we have, this is a very recent feature, but it's actually been sort of a long time in gestation. Um, and we, we kind of like finally figured out how it should look and how, how, to, how to use it effectively. Um, and that is easy to use implicit generated functions. And that term is not really standard. We kind of had to come up with something because there wasn't a specific term for this because I don't know any other language that has this feature. But we will get to that. That'll be the last thing I demo in the, th in the talk. Um, so three of these things are forms of staged programming, if you can read sideways there. Um, Just-in-time compilation, macros, uh, and generated functions are all forms of generated programming. Uh, in order to talk about those, we need to talk about types first. I am going to leave out entirely in this talk actually probably the most you know, salient feature of the language overall, which is that it's a multiple dispatch la programming language. But I've given many talks on that before, and you can find some of them online. So I'm just going to focus on this staged programming business. Um, and you, you can ask me about multiple dispatch after the talk. Um, so let's actually see some code. I you know feel like it's you need a sense of what a programming language looks like. So here's one of our micro benchmarks, uh, random matrix statistics. Uh, it looks a lot like MATLAB. Um, this is very, very close to being valid MATLAB code. You change like a couple of square braces indexing into arrays to parentheses, and you you could run this in MATLAB. Um, it take you know it initializes some zero vectors, generates some random Gaussian matrices, does some concatenation in different directions, does uh, some you know inner products between the, the matrices, takes them to the fourth power, and then takes a trace and then saves that. Um, no, you'll note that there are no types mentioned anywhere here. This is, you know, this is how you program in MATLAB. You don't, you don't talk about types. You just, they're sort of implicit. Everything is a complex matrix in MATLAB. Um, but you can also write stuff like this. This is another one of our, um, our micro benchmarks. This is a really simple, like, you know, textbook quicksort implementation. Um, what's interesting about this, and what you wouldn't even think about doing in a language like MATLAB uh, or R, is that we are just shuffling around a array elements. So we're writing while loops and you know taking indices and doing pivots and doing some bit shifts in there. This is this is stuff that would just be dog slow, but this actually is you know it's got C-like speed in Julia, which is sort of one of the selling points. Um, there's recursion, of course, in there, which is you know you know you should have recursion in a real programming language. Um, so but you can also do sort of weirdly different things that don't look like any of these other programming languages. This is a bit chunk of code that actually implements a pretty usable modular integer type that does modular in in integer arithmetic for you. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much. Some key things that you might notice is it de it's declared as immutable. So numeric types are typically something you want to have immutable. This allows the compiler to reason about it much more efficiently. It's also good for numbers because numbers are defined by their value. You can't, if you take a complex number and you change its real part, you have a different complex number. You don't have the same complex number that happens to, to name different values. Like, yeah, numbers are not containers, they're, they're values. Arrays are containers, so arrays are mutable. Um, you can argue, there's different languages where they don't take that approach, but for numerical computing, it's pretty key to have mutable arrays. Um, and then you just define some operations on it, minus, plus, times. Um, uh, an interesting factor here is that so we have parametric types. I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, in this case, the, the param per type parameter is the modulus, n. Um, and when you construct the thing, you reduce the argument modulo, modulo n, and then you make sure that all your arithmetic happens that way. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into this. This is actually a, a good example for multiple dispatch, but since I'm not talking about that. But that's just kind of weird Julia-looking code. Um, obligatory performance graphs, because of one of the reasons people are really interested in Julia a lot of the time is because it's fast. It's a dynamic language, but it's fast. So how is it fast? So this is time of running some, some micro benchmarks relative to C. It's on a log scale. Um, and you can see that Julia is all the way over there on the left. Um, Octave is all the way over there on the right. Um, 
And we are within a factor of two of C on all of these micro benchmarks. And these are these are you know pretty simple things. They do stuff like uh, the, the random matrix multiply thing I showed you, uh, the quick sort thing I showed you, other things like compu computing a Mandelbrot set, uh, using uh, you know this iterative summation algorithm that approximates pi, computing Fibonacci numbers with a really really stupid brain dead uh, double recursive formula. That's not to see how fast you are at computing Fibonacci numbers. It's to see how fast you are at recursion. So people will like implement it in other languages and be like, oh, it's much faster. And that's because you didn't use the stupid algorithm that is doubly recursive. Um, there are better ways to compute Fibonacci numbers. That's not the point. Um, yeah. So what you can see here is that you know we're within a factor of two of C, and you know a lot of the competing tools like R and MATLAB and uh, and Octave are orders of magnitude slower. Um, JavaScript does quite well for a dynamic language, and Python is you know a respectably good interpreter, but it's still like you know. Anywhere between like 10 and 100 times slower than C. Um, so this is an interesting graph. This is uh, from those same micro benchmarks, and it's a little unfair because we've spent more work on our micro benchmarks probably than on the other micro benchmarks. But this is time relative to C versus normalized lines of code, um, and you can see that Julia is the gray dot all the way down in the lower left corner, which means very fast and very terse. Um, there are other languages that are just as fast, like C, but it's pretty verbose. And there are other languages that are almost as terse, like, you know, uh, I can't tell quite what the colors are there. Um, it's not, no, JavaScript is actually wildly, oh, R is actually the orange, the, the purple one. R is, for some reason, the dot doesn't show up on the right, but, um, you know. So anyway, R is, R is pretty terse on these things, but it, the performance is less good. Okay. Um, so types. So Sam and I were talking earlier. Julia, he he, from his perspective, Julia doesn't actually have types. We have tags. It's because it's dynamic. We don't actually type check anything. Um, my favorite quote about this, which I will probably use forever, is I like that Julia uses the type system in all the ways that don't end with the programmer arguing with the compiler. And this was Leah when she was learning Julia at Hacker School, um, which has now been renamed to the Recourse Center. Um, and uh, you know, I just love this quote. I think this really nails it. Um, so, w w if you're not going to check types, what's the point in having them? This is sort of you know the obvious question. Um, and so the, the, the real, like, if, you, if I had to pick one reason, there are many good things about being able to talk about types, but if I had to pick one single reason, it is arrays. So let's say you have this array. It's got a floating point number, it's got a string, it's got an integer and a complex number. Um, so it's, this is a heterogeneous array. This has got no particular type. Um, and this is represented in memory something like this. Uh, it is, there's a type tag, T, which tells you like what kind of thing this is, because dynamic languages keep these tags around to tell them that kind of thing at runtime. Uh, and then it's got a bunch of pointers to individual objects, which are themselves also type tagged, and it random places on the heap. Um, we do a thing where the pointer actually points to the data and not the tag. That actually lets us pass our structs directly to C, and C has this, like, understands them as is, which is kind of cool. Um, this is, you know, fine. This is a great flexible data structure. This is the key array data structure in, you know, every dynamic language pretty much. It's uh, maybe not Lisp because Lisp has like con cells, but in like Python, you know, Ruby, Perl, these are this is what your array looks like fundamentally. Um, now, what if this these all happen to be floating point numbers, right? We could still represent them the same way. It could be an any typed array of floating point numbers. That's totally fine. Um, the, the, the expression on top is actually like the valid input syntax for Julia for this, this particular value. But there is a much better way to represent it, which is like this. You just keep the floating point numbers in line, and there's no pointers, and there's no extra tags, and you have base, you've actually cut down your, over, your memory storage by a third, a factor of three. It is now one third as much, because those tags are as big as the floating point numbers on 64-bit systems. 
Um, not only did you save yourself a factor of three in memory, but now like the the cache locality is so much better. If you scan through this the if you scan through this thing, you're just jumping all over memory and nothing is ever in cache and you're you're kind of just you're you're kind of hosed in terms of performance. If you're going through this thing, you are all good. It is completely predictable what you're going to hit if you're scanning through it in linear order, which is a pretty common thing to do. Um, Another another benefit, which is absolutely crucial in numerical computing, is that you are able to pass this as is in memory to you know the numeric libraries that have been worked on for decades for things like matrix multiply, uh, fast fast Fourier transform, um, you know you name it. There's all these libraries. This is the format they expect because this is how C does it. This is how Fortran does it. So we need this. So we need to be able to express that the like this, the fact that this thing is an array. Um, whose type, whose element type is float. So now suddenly we need we need an array type, we need a float, and we need to be able to express that the element type of the array is float, and we also want to express that it's one-dimensional. Uh, that's a slightly different thing. I'm going to show you how we talk about that. Um, okay, so can everybody see that? Is that? That's a little small. It's also a little too far to the left. Uh, there we go. That's probably a little more visible. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So, um, so let's have an array that is, uh, you know, let's try the 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 you know foo, one point two five, you know one plus two m thing. Okay. Um, and you can see that the the you, we print the array as a column because you know vectors are actually columns in math. Um, it's also kind of nice for printing sometimes. Uh, and you can see that the, the it's a three element array. The element type is any, and the dimension number of dimensions is one because it's a vector. Um, but if we actually do something like this, where everything happens to be of the same type, um, Julia notices that they're all the same type, and it gives you an array of float 64s. Um, uh, we can also do things that are you know multi-dimensional. Um, we have to get rid of the commas for various fiddly reasons that are probably going to change, but uh, uh, and now we get a two-dimensional array of again of float 64s. Okay, so uh, and, and this is this is stored you know completely contiguously in memory. If we look at B, we can get a pointer to it. We can get a pointer to B. We do allow you to do pointer arithmetic. We just make it ugly so you will not be tempted to do it. Um, and you can actually do an unsafe load. I'm like showing you the semi under underbelly of the language like right away. Um, you can unsafe load that pointer and you get the first value. Um, you can unsafe load the pointer. The pointer plus eight will give you 3.4. If you give the pointer plus one, you're gonna get some nonsense because you're not aligned with the array, but you know, you can do that if you want to. Um, you can also subtract eight and get the tag, which happens to be zero. That's weird. I don't know why that is. Oh, it's because the tag is actually for arrays, not immediately in front of the object, um, because we can reallocate them anyway. Um, okay, so that's 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 why we have types. That's like the one main reason why we have types. Um, there are many other nice things you can do with them, but that's you know the most important. Um, so staged programming, I, I couldn't really find a good definition of what this is in general on, on Wikipedia because it's very um, typed language centric. Uh, I would generally define it as allowing the programmer to hook into various points in the transformation of programs from source to machine code. Um, and so there's various different ways of doing this. This is a diagram of how Julia code goes from source to machine code. Um, lexing, parsing, Lowering type inlining type inference LLVM code gen and then optimization and then native code gen. That part is Julia. That's what we are responsible for. And then we hand it off to LLVM, which does the rest. This bottom part is like super super hard, and the fact that we can rely on an external like a system for this is like decades worth of work saved. Um, but we have to be good. In, we have to hand it good LLVM IR, or it's not going to do anything useful. Um, this is kind of a terrifying diagram, so I'm going to simplify it a little bit. Um, source text, you lex and parse it, you get an AST. Um, 
this is some sort of data structure that represents your code, but in a like nice machine-friendly format, not a string, right? Because a string, you take out pieces of the string, it's got nothing to do with the structure of your code. It's just a, a substring. Uh, and AST is like an actual data structure. In Lisp, it's it's a list. Uh, in Julio, we use expression types, objects, and various other types um, to represent our code. And we'll see that in a second. We then do lowering, inlining, and type inference in Julia, actually. Uh, and we get a typed AST, which is an AST where we've made our best guesses about what the types of all the expressions are. And if your code is pretty clear, like straightforward code, which numerical code often is, because it's just some loops that compute stuff, um, we can, you know, 60% of the time we can figure out concrete types for things. Uh, and that 60% tends to be the part that's performance critical. There's often stuff where you just don't care. I'm like, you know, I'm, uh, I'm com parsing command line arguments. I don't care if I can infer the types of them. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then code gen. So native, you generate native code from the typed AST. Um, so macros operate at the AST level. So macros let you take an, a take an AST and hook in a user-defined function and replace some of the AST with, with a generated piece of AST. Um, and this is incredibly useful for all sorts of things. And uh, we'll see some examples of this. Um, JIT is also a form of, you know, of code generation and stage programming because instead of generating all your code up front, you wait until you absolutely need the stuff. And then once you know exactly what you need, you generate code to run, and then you run it. Uh, and then in the future, you've cached that thing you generated, and you just run that directly. Um, so you can imagine where you know, the third thing might come in. Generated functions are in the middle. Uh, and this is the part that's a little unusual and a little weird. Um, but, but it's been very, very handy. OK. So now we're done with slides, and we're just going to see code. OK, so the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, how JIT works. Um, all right. So we're going to define a function called collats. Uh, and I'm not going to mention any types. I'm just going to just, it's going to be like MATLAB style, except this would be really slow in MATLAB. So while n is great, so k equals 0, while n is equal to 1, we're going to update n. We're going to check if it's odd. And if uh, n is odd, we're going to um, Multiply it by 3 and add 1. If n is even, we're going to bit shift it right by 1, which is the same thing as doing div by 2, but it's cooler looking and faster. Um, and then we're going to increment k. We're basically counting how many times we do this. And then at the end, we return k. OK, so colots, let's call it on like the number 10, return 6, OK. Uh, let's call it on a bunch of numbers. Um, n for n equals one through a hundred. You see, those are the, that's the colots counts for a bunch of different numbers from one to a hundred. We allied the, the the array so that you don't because a lot of systems like you ask you're working with like a million by a million array and then like you accidentally print it and you're like oh stop 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 like please stop printing. Um, so we don't do that. Um, seems seems much easier. Um, yeah, so, okay, cool. Uh, so what's interesting, does anybody notice anything about this function, this function definition? Like, what's kind of concerning about this? Huh? Uh, no, no, no. So is there, like, is there something that might be considered a bug about this, maybe? Yes. Does it ever end? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So this is actually a famous conjecture known as the Colotz conjecture. The Colotz conjecture is that this function terminates. Um, nobody knows. No, like everything, every number that anybody has checked, it does actually, I, I mean up to like billions and trillions, it, it does actually terminate eventually. Um, but nobody has proved it. It's also even hypothesized that it is independent from the axioms of set theory. That like you can neither prove nor disprove this in ZFC. Weird, right? Um, that's sort of neither here nor there for us, um, but I just think it's a cool example. I'm going to show you a couple of interesting things we can do. So uh, the first time we ran this, um, so, you know, colots on 10, uh, the first time it actually compiled the code to do this. Uh, and what does that code look like? I'm glad you asked. Uh, the LLVM code looks like this, um, and it's about... I don't know, here you go. It's about like 
a short, you know, it's, it almost fits on the screen. Um, it's not super readable because LLVM is not really meant to be human readable or human writable, but it is sort of like vaguely human readable. Um, the native code is actually much cleaner. It fits on one screen. This is insanely efficient. This is really nice. Um, this is pretty much just, you know, a couple of instructions. Uh, you'll note that uh, there's kind of a fun trick that's going on in the middle there, LEAQ. I didn't know what this instruction was. I've kind of learned what these instructions are from poking around looking at these things. Um, it's load effective address, and it's actually this instruction that's meant for finding memory addresses, but it's actually really handy for computing small integer polynomials. So LLVM will do this, this transformation, and use LEA to, to do this at all, like this polynomial in one instruction. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's, that's the machine code. Um, what's kind of cool about this, remember that we didn't, we didn't mention types. So Julia has this whole like smorgasbord of uh, of just different integer types, and so there is actually another problem with this with this whole um, with this function, which maybe is what you were getting to. Uh, it could overflow, right? So for really big numbers, this thing might overflow, and then you know we're we're gonna we're gonna be in trouble. So for example, let's say uh, type max int, right? Type max int is two to the thirty one minus one. Uh, it is an odd number, so the first thing we're going to do is multiply it by 3 and then add 1, but it's going to overflow. Um, so let's actually, let's instrument this and see what it print, what it does. Yeah, so the first thing it does is 3 times this plus 1, which is not that. But that is what happens in in the integer with well the way you know machines do integer arithmetic. So what we can do is we can actually do uh, you know uh, use a different integer type. So let's use a big int um, and let's time this. Okay, wow. Okay, that did a lot more iterations, and that's because it actually did it correctly. Big ints don't overflow, and you can see there's a lot of big numbers here. It gets kind of kind of beefy in there. Um, but yeah, it's the same code. Um, the, the code, this is way slower. This is not going to be the nice, tight, clean thing because you're like allocating integer objects and it, it's actually a beast. Like big ints are not fast. Um, but what you can do is you can actually go sort of in intermediate. We do have a bigger t type called int128, which we could do. And we figure, you know, 128 bits is probably, none of those numbers were more than 128 bits. So we can see that we get the same thing. So there's a bunch of allocation there. Why there shouldn't be any allocation in this algorithm? The allocation is actually the code gen. So if we run this again, oh, is it still allocating? Oh, that's disappointing. Um, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be allocating. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Um, let's take a look at the code. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to take the printout. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's take the printout. Yes, if you print, you allocate. That is a thing. Um, yes, so let's, let's, do this. let's do this again. Okay. Ah, so now you see the first time it does it does the uh it does it does JIT. It the reason there's allocation when we run that is because one of the things it has to do is generate the the code that you're actually gonna run and then run it. The second time you've already got the code, there's no allocation required. Um and for some reason it's faster the first time. I don't really understand why that is. Oh yeah, someone changed the way this is printed. So yeah, so it's much it's like orders of magnitude faster the second time. Good. Um, all right, so let's take a look at the code native. We can see that it's not nearly as nice, but it's still only a couple pages of machine code. Um, and that's, it's using 128-bit integers. So, and LLVM knows how to generate, sort of how to synthesize the operations you'd like to do on those. Um, okay, so this is, this is JIT. You can see why this is powerful. You write this sort of generic algorithm and then you can just run that same, you know, type code that doesn't mention types at all on a bunch of different types of things and get, you know, get it to work. And it just does what it's supposed to do. Um, so let's let's move on to the next thing, um, which is macros. So Julia has, you know, pretty straightforward macros, although we have the burden of syntax. Lisp gets away with not having much syntax, so things are actually much easier. We can we can quote expressions. So for example, if we write a plus b. Um, that is, and we dump that object and show its internal structure, we can see that it is an expression object with a head field that is the symbol call, 
uh, and arguments which are three symbols, the symbol plus, the symbol A, and the symbol B. Um, we can also go in and mutate this guy. We're, remember, this is not a pure language. We're impure, so we're going to be impure and have impure thoughts and mutate things. Um, so I changed x.args3 to, to C, and now we can see that the expression is an A plus C instead of A plus B. Um, we can also go in and do things like, you know, change the head to be the symbol F instead of the symbol plus. And now we see that F, it, it prints differently. That's just because F is not one of the special functions that has its own syntax. Plus is just a function, which is actually one of the design goals of the language and why we have multiple dispatches. So plus can be just a function. But it does have nice special syntax because people like writing infix arithmetic expressions. OK, so we can do things with this. So we have x, and we can do uh, you know, eval x. And it's going to say, well, uh, I, don't, I don't know what f is. So we can say, all right, let's, let's define f. f x plus xy equals uh, 2x plus y minus 1. Um, actually, let's make it y squared. I don't know, whatever. Uh, and now we can eval the expression. And it's going to say, OK, well, c isn't defined. Um, actually, let's make a 1.2, and let's make c. Uh, 3, and then we can eval the expression again, and this time it should actually work. And it gives us, it computes that expression for us. Okay. Um, so that's that's all pretty straightforward. If you're familiar with Lisp, this should be, you know, nothing nothing surprising. The main thing is that we have these, uh, you know, it's, it's this... Uh, this expression object, you know, it's a totally legitimate way to represent your AST, but it's not as uniform as just doing everything with lists. But, you know, you have syntax, you live with it. Um, people love their syntax. This is one thing I have learned. Um, myself not excluded. Um, okay, so so what this is, you know, okay, we, we generate some, some expressions, but this isn't macros yet. Um, so what you can do with macros, what macros are is you, you basically, you, you can, yeah, since you can construct these sorts of things, um, you can also like take them as arguments because they're just values, and then you can produce new ex new expressions which you then evaluate. Um, all right. So, for example, here's a macro. Uh, macro foo. It takes an expression and it just prints the expression. Or I'll just do show. Okay, so at foo, and we give it the expression 1 plus 2, and it, it's, you see that it gets the expression as its argument. Um, it also returns the expression, so that means it just actually is this macro as if it, as if it wasn't there. Um, but we can do other things with it. For example, the time macro um, times something, uh, and we, uh, you've seen me using that a bunch of times. Now, it can't evaluate sleep first, because if it evaluated sleep, then it would be too late to time it. So what this does is it actually does, uh, we can see what the macro expands to. Um, it y defines a bunch of local variables and then, and then you know, does a bunch of stuff before and then actually does the sleep and then does a bunch of stuff after and then prints some stuff and then returns the expression that you got. So time is this macro that actually generates this code for you. Um, anyway, so you're telling me to wrap it up. How much time do I have? I'm done. Ah, oh, it's a shame. I wanted to get to generated functions. Um, can I just like blow through my question time and do generated functions? Okay, let's do it. All right. Um, okay, so this is how macros work. So generated functions are this interesting thing that are like between those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, let's say you had you want a function that look that operates on n-dimensional arrays. This is the problem we've had. Like we've we've actually faced this, and we're like, I don't know how to do this efficiently. So let's say you have a three-dimensional array, and you want to iterate through all of the elements in it. The obvious thing to do is you want to like do, write some code that looks like this. For i1 equals 1 through size a comma 1, um, you know, for i2 equals 1 through size a comma 2. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Uh, for i3 equals 1 through, th OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is already getting tedious to type. Uh, and then we might want to do something like print line uh, a i1, i1, i2, i3 equals, and then we actually want to pull out the argument i1, i2, i3.
Okay. So, well, A is just w one single thing, but let's say that A is actually uh, a 3 by 2 by 5. Um, so I, I generated some, let's make it a little smaller, 3 by 2 by 3. Um, you know, if I do that, I get I, I iterate through all the values in A, and this is super efficient. Um, because you know it's just all scalar scalar operations, but the problem is how do you write a generic version of this? If I want a function that does this for any number of dimensions for an array, then I, I don't know what to do because the number the problem is that the code depends on the number of for loops that are supposed to be nested depends on the dimensionality of the array that's coming in. So the way that we've dealt with this in the past is you do this thing called linear indexing, where you just are like, yeah, I don't care about the dimensions. Just give me a pointer in memory, and I'm just going to scan through it in the order it happens to be in memory. And that's fine for contiguous arrays, but sometimes you want to do other things. Um, like, you know, you have a slice of a contiguous array, and the only way to do it is with this for loop approach, where you sort of increment by a certain amount after each for loop. Um, and, and one of the things you could do is you could try to do linear indexing and then use div and mod operations to get you to the right place, but it's brutally slow. It's like div is not a fast instruction. It's shockingly slow, even integer div. So what you really want is you want to be able to generate the right number of nested loops. Um, and I'm going to show you some code that actually does that. In the interest of time, I'm just going to cut and paste it from here. Um, okay. So... What this does, I'll explain what this does in a second. Um, essentially, so essentially, what this does is it when you when you have when you put this at generated thing in front of a function definition, um, which you see at the bottom here, uh, and this whole the whole this whole body could actually be in there. You could write this this way. Um, you could just write at generated function blah, and then just do this and get rid of the. The gen. The only reason I separated it out into a function is so we can s easily see what it does. Um, so this is this is a staged function definition, um, and what this does is it actually it 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 is called at the time when the system knows what the types of the arguments are, but does not yet know what the uh, the values are because it's still generating code. Um, and so a instead of being the array itself is the type of the array, and so now you have the option to generate code based on the types of the arguments that do the thing you want. And then that is actually fed back into the rest of the system, and then you get the code that comes out. And so let me show you what that looks like. Um, so n loops, it does, let's, let's show what it does. It prints you know, a in order. It does the same thing as the hand rolled thing. Um, but yeah, so what we, what, what we, call, the, we call the generator part on the type of a, because that's how it works, and it produces this expression. That's what the generated function returns. It returns an expression, which is the thing that we wanted. So, um, so now let's say we uh, let's say instead of a, we had uh, a two-dimensional thing, or let's say a one-dimensional thing first. So, uh, oh, it's typo. Sorry. You have to keep track of if you're in the value or ty type domain. Okay. So here we have uh, the one-dimensional version. You see, it has one nested loop. Uh, here we have the two-dimensional version it has two nested loops. Uh, here we have the three-dimensional version, yada yada yada, and this will work, you know, up to up to however many you want. Um, and this is the like ex this is the efficient th hand like code that you would have written by hand. This is actually simplified writing numerical libraries in Julia like a massive amount. We've like deleted so much code because of this adding this functionality. So anyway, I'm like massively over time, so I'm gonna call it a day. Thank you. Do we have time for one question? <laughs> okay. So I tried Julia a while back, but I'm not an active user now. I was just wondering how the plotting capabilities lately compared to, say, matplotlib or something you might use to make scientific graphs in Python. Excellent question. Uh, so you can just call matplotlib. Um, you can also call, you know, Python PyPlot as a matplotlib connector. Uh, there's a native Julia thing called Gadfly, which is really quite nice and has matured a lot. Uh, there's several other options. Um, I think in a true open source style, you're never going to be like this is the one true plotting library. There's always going to it's like going to be like Python. There's like five different ways to do it, but they're all pretty good these days. 
Um, all right, thanks, that was my one question. Thanks.